Yeah. Um, I got to do a deep dive into Pizza Hut training videos and like, <laughs> they were like these people who were 80s-tastic, like blue eyeshadow, uh, the little bow. Those are uh, my people. Hi there, I'm Lon Lam. And I'm Tucker Shaw, and we're with America's Test Kitchen. So we're here with another edition of Ask ATK, and um, here are some questions we got from people over the weekend. Yeah, we got a um, lot right, of questions. We got so many questions, so thank you so much for uh, sending them in. I'm going to try to stump Lon a little bit oh, here not today. Not hard. Nope, nothing hard. Um, you want me to start off? With, yeah, with let's do this. Okay. Um, okay. This is a question from Charlie Aguo, I think. It's a little hard to know how to pronounce uh, some people's names. Um, beginner cook here. When frying an egg, what should the stove be on? High, medium, or low? Ooh. Um, let's see. I cook eggs at medium high. I want the pan to be hot enough that, um, that when you crack the egg in there, it uh, the very bottom firms up and pulls away from the pan almost immediately. Mm -hmm. That kind of, um, I guess it's because I use a carbon steel skillet instead of nonstick. If you have nonstick, it's less of an issue. But I do think you get better results with kind of, uh, with a more aggressive approach. You, what do you do, You Tucker? get that satisfaction too when the egg like hits and you're like, okay, I can immediately see something happening there, you know? Yeah, it um, makes that kind of cool sputtery sound. Exactly. Yeah, I think I probably, I usually use nonstick for a fried egg, uh, I, unless I'm using car, um, cast iron. But I would say I'm probably more on a medium. I think mm -hmm. I'm more on a medium. I just think, um, you know, I, here's one thing I can't stand about fried eggs. I, I'm not crazy about a crispy edge. I know that makes me strange. Oh. But I kind of no, like no, no. sort of no, a no. soft and just sort of quiet white and then like a little bit of a runny yolk, not crazy yeah. runny, but I'm not wild about the like crispy brown edge. What about you? Oh gosh, I, um, I love eggs, so it doesn't really yeah. matter all that much, but I was a brunch cook for a couple of years there and um, That's a lot of I eggs. Can tell you the, <laughs> I can tell you the egg I don't like. There was, um, no one's gonna know, so I'm gonna use her name. Okay. There was a woman named Suzanne who would roll up to our bar and she would ask for an egg with a super crispy white um, that was fully cooked. The yolk had to be perfectly runny. Oh and so I'd have to have a screaming hot um, carbon steel pan, mm -hmm. crack the egg in there, and then add butter and baste the, um, baste the white in order to get it cooked through um, without overcooking the yolk, at least favorite egg. <laughs> also going sunny side up after that? Yep, yep. <sighs> you, you, there was no chance to flip or to like help that yolk out. It was, um, if you ever want to annoy, test a brunch <laughs> cook, that's the egg to order. Brunch but, is you know, such a, a, nice tar tip. a hard shift too. I think brunch is tough because you're, you're just cooking so many eggs. It really, oh, the eggs. Are you a brunch eggs. customer? Ooh, not really. Mm. I mean, it's not, I love brunch, but um, I always feel a little bit of guilt going out to brunch. Like, I know the, the like, kind of hungover, not enough <laughs> sleep, because I worked a late service, and now I'm back three hours later to cook brunch. Yeah. Um, it's not a great feeling, so I, I don't go out to brunch that often. Yeah. I like brunch all right. I always feel like I'm getting chipped, like sort of like cheated out of a meal though. Like I want three what? meals in a day. I don't want two. You know what I'm saying? No, brunch is amazing. Brunch is the fourth meal. Oh, okay. Now my mind is blown. <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> okay. So you're doing breakfast, brunch, lunch, and dinner. And maybe yeah, a little you know. snack in the afternoon. Yeah. Why not tea? Tea is great. It's an excuse it. to eat cookies. I love it. Okay, here's another um, question. I'm going to send you another one. This is from right. S. Ray one What is the point in pie weights? Is it a scam? My pies are always fine without them. Do you use pie weights? I usually use you, I've seen you. beans and so, sometimes I'll use sugar, which I think Stella Parks kind of introduced me to that idea. Um, she's yeah. the, she wrote the Brave Tart cookbook. 
Um, yeah. But are they a I, scam? I don't know. But you can get around it. Well, I mean, depends on if you always have other stuff on hand. I know we've run a lot of quick tips in the past about other things you can use yeah. in place of pie weights. Um, and I do think there's value in making sure that um, your crust doesn't slump or melt as yeah, um, you you're really par-baking it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know what kind of pies this person is making. There are certainly pies where you don't need weights, but um, you know, some doughs need that little bit of support while they're while they're baking up. And um, it's not going to hurt your pie and, anyway, so you might as well yeah, use it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you can if you're using beans or rice, you can you don't have to throw those away. You can just save them and reuse them. Totally. I think you can even cook and eat them later depending on how many times they've been used. Oh, that so. might be interesting. I wonder if like, the, especially the rice takes on kind of a toasty quality from being the oven. I, I mean, I doubt it, but who knows? Yeah, I, gosh, I feel like I've been to a tasting where I've eaten rice that was uh, used as pie weights. And mm. I think if I'm remembering this correctly, um, the every time you bake the the rice, it kind of modifies the starches slightly, and so eventually yeah. the texture really goes. But you know, if you've only used them once, I don't think I think you can just you know you can eat that rice. Well, it's worth and, a shot. So, yeah. And if it doesn't yeah. taste so, good, then yeah. now you know for next time. I know somebody who uses <laughs> pennies instead of pie weights, but mm -hmm. I've always felt like, first of all, let's wash those. A gross. Let's like let's give those a really really <laughs> like vigorous cleansing yeah and then also maybe don't hand them out to the kids right away out of the oven you know what i mean <laughs> i feel like they're gonna hold on to some heat yeah maybe um you know i'm sure they work fine and we'll do in a pinch if you have four cups of pennies right. kicking around right. and you know nobody uses them these days maybe you do have four cups I of pennies know, kicking around right i mean they're just sitting around so who cares yeah <laughs> All right, I'm gonna find a question okay. for you. Um, I'm scared. Let's see. No, don't be scared. Um, this is from Kareem Asani, Asahi. I, sorry, part of your name is cut off and I'm not sure I got it right. Uh, but they ask, <clears throat> what are the quintessential must have ingredients in any cooking other than salt and pepper? Any cooking at all? That's yeah. a very big umbrella. Um, well, I would so actually if we narrowed this. Go ahead. If we narrowed this down to your cooking. Okay. Um, I'm actually gonna like amend the question a little bit because <laughs> pepper is not always welcome in every dish that I make. I like pepper, but I don't feel like it belongs everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Salt, of course. And then I guess yeah. after that, the thing that I probably use the most is just like tons and tons and tons of olive oil. Like I just drown yeah. things in olive oil. And um, to me it adds like a beautiful, beautiful velvety texture. Depending on the olive oil, it can add a, a really beautiful peppery flavor or sort of a soft floral flavor or, or whatever. I mean, olive oils are so different. And they don't, again, belong in, ev it doesn't belong in everything, but it's probably the thing I use the most. Yeah, for sure. How about you? I, I don't know if I can answer this question. It um, really depends on what I make, but like aside from stuff like, um, you know, an assortment of acidic things, mm. whether it's vinegar or citrus, mm. um, an assortment of fats, um, oils, butters, um, I guess I, I would have trouble giving up, um, and it's not like I use this stuff all the time, but I, I don't think I could give up eggs. Oh, yeah. um, they're just, they're so versatile, whether you're cooking or baking. Um, I, I love them in pretty much all forms. Um, pickled, um, the, the mashed up into a sandwich, mm -hmm. baked, poached. Um, they're miraculous, aren't they? I mean, they're just yeah, like, like I, I adore miracles. eggs. They're, they're so functional too, um, but I guess the other ingredient 
and this is cheating because it's a group, but um, allions. I could mm. not give up onions or garlic no. or scallions no. or shallots. No. Um, no. And why I, would you? I think. Really? <laughs> they're so good, right? I'm so yeah. glad I don't have to avoid them. I know there are people out there who are um, uh, have aversions or are allergic, and um, that sucks, man. I'm so sorry. That would be rough. Although something you just said makes me think want to rethink this question a little bit because if I were to frame this question into what is the one thing I always buy every time I go to the grocery store, no matter what, uh -huh. whether it's on my list or not, is lemons. I just, I always, I find I always need a lemon. And I think yeah. that citrus is probably my favorite category of flavors. And to me, lemon followed closely by lime are kind of the most versatile citrus flavors to me. Yeah. That sort of like fit in sweet things or savory things or quick things or long cooking things or whatever. I can't get enough. Yeah, like in, in the same way that you can perk up a dish by like adding a little salt or totally. um, a drizzle of olive oil, a little splash of uh, juice, it does wonders. And it's so... So true. Especially yeah, like on great. meat, like on savory things. Like I occasionally mm -hmm. get yelled at by my general practitioner about my salt intake. <laughs> oh, no. and, uh, I know, well, she's right. But um, if you spritz a little bit of lemon onto a steak or a piece of chicken or, or a piece of fish or a piece of pork or anything, it has yeah. very similar to me flavor enhancers that salt would have. Like it brings out a little bit, you don't want to drown it, but just like a little pop really brings out some savory depth and really sort of satisfying umami kind of flavor, especially like on yeah. a steak, which feels a little incongruous maybe, but it totally works and you're not eating more salt. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, um, and, and like all that oil in the zest, it's so good. It's I so feel good. like the only people who really make use of it are bartenders, but the rest of us should be using like zests as much as possible. It's a, it's a waste to kind of toss that stuff out. A hundred percent. Also, you can freeze zest. Did you know that? Yeah. It, which is great because you can, you can zest your lemon before you juice it. Always do that just so mm -hmm. you get the zest off. You might use it right now or you might use it later. But you get the zest yeah. off and then you you can freeze it like in little clumps of a, a teaspoon or two so that when you go into the freezer to get it back out, you don't have to like rip it off of a big hunk or get too much or too little. You can freeze it or even in like little ice cube trays. Mm -hmm. Super handy. That's a great tip. Uh, big on tips. I love a tip. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see. Hey, do you eat tinned fish? Oh obsessed okay i've got a tinned fish question for okay. you then um hello deva writes tinned fish is so popular what's the best way to ease into this trend and how is it best enjoyed oh it's so personal i don't know the best way to ease into it i think um you need to go buy yourself a tin of sardines and just open it up and take a fork and get into it. I, I feel like this is true with almost any kind of new food that you're, or new new product that you're introducing yourself to, is to eat it in isolation if you can, mm -hmm. so that you really get a sense of what the flavors are there. Um, yeah. Sardines can be different from tin to tin, and sometimes they're prepared with um, different seasonings or whatever inside, and if they come from different parts of the world, that will have an effect also. But I love, love, love like a tin of sardines and a piece of crusty toast or bread uh, and butter. And to me, that's like a perfect breakfast. And I could do it without the bread and butter, honestly. I mean, I'm kind of a cat. Yeah, I, I, I adore tin fish. Um, it, it almost doesn't matter what it is. I mean, I'm gonna draw the line at like bumblebee but right, right. Um, well, you can doctor it but, up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, like it's there. There are just so many amazing flavors and textures packed into this tiny little package that keeps forever. It's um, I always have a couple cans of something in my pantry, and um, uh, whenever whenever I don't feel like cooking, my go-to meal is to like cut up some vegetables, whatever I've got kicking around in the fridge, 
pop a tin, um, toast some bread, and pour a glass of wine. I'll add cheese if I'm being fancy. So good. I mean, especially when it's like 150 degrees out like it is today. <laughs> yeah, that's dinner tonight for shorties. <laughs> totally. There's also like, I feel like there's a lot of um, experimentation you could do, especially with, with things like sardines, because there are so many different producers around the world and you can find yeah. specialty markets like um, there's a place that I order from sometimes called Portugalia which specializes in Portuguese imports and they yeah. have like I don't know eight or ten different producers of sardines and they're all different and sometimes they're real meaty and like chunky and sometimes they're sort of a little bit smoother and, and um, mm -hmm. have more of an uh, the, whatever they're packed in there's more of a presence there but I'm just nuts yeah. about them. Do you um do you try the other stuff like the cockles, mussels, octopus, yeah. mackerel? Yep. Tr um, tried everything. Any thoughts? Any favorites? Um, I am not always. Listen, I will eat any of them because I love these things. Um, I'm not always seeking out mackerel. Um, mm -hmm. I like it when it's sort of fresh caught and cooked very much because mm -hmm. I do feel like it's a super oily fish and you get like a lot of that kind of marine ocean flavor with a really um, fresh piece of mackerel. But I found like for me in, in the tin, it gets a little bit, uh, it loses some personality, I guess. And maybe yeah. it almost takes on a sourness. I don't know. What about you? Mm -hmm. Are you into the octopus or cockles um, or? Shellfish. I adore shellfish. It, um, it, they're, they're just, they have this, dense meatiness to it like yeah. the way that they're packed they're not they're not like that kind of freshly steamed um and uh, you know a freshly steamed uh shellfish has a little bit of chew to it mm -hmm. still yeah um the canned stuff is just ultra tender mm. and um it's kind of a different texture it's almost it's got more of a cured meat texture yeah. it's i love it yeah and um they, they, it comes smoked uh, with kind of a piri piri sauce mm -hmm. or a tomato sauce or with lemon and olive oil. Like I'll take, I'll take one of each. They're so good. I love that. So good. Plus you eat it right out of the can. So that's less dishes. Yeah, no dishes. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we really feel at ATK. Yeah, yeah right. Fewer dishes is better. All right, I'm gonna get one for you here. Okay. <clears throat> This one's tough. Um, can you explain the appeal or purpose of bleached flour? Nope. Neither. <laughs> Pass. Uh, no, that's not true. I um, bleached bleaching is um, it changes the starches in the flour so they absorb differently and you get a different texture. Mm. Um, I can't get into more detail than that because uh, I just. I'm not a baker and um, I haven't had to work on a recipe where I specifically needed uh, bleached flour, but I know that um, Andrea, Andrea Geary, uh, developed a yellow cake mm -hmm. that um, really relies on bleached flour. It, the structure, the tenderness, the, um, that cake's appeal, appealing texture is due to the bleaching process. And um, so, you know, there, I know it sounds kind of technical and bad, like why would you want bleach in your food? Um, but in this case, it's um, they're not using bleach. It's just a treatment that uh, modifies the starches slightly. There is um, something about it. Like if you have a little dish of bleached flour and a little dish of unbleached flour in front of you, and maybe mm -hmm. one day this is sort of a fun experiment to try at home, you can feel a difference in texture and I wonder if that is due to the bleaching or just due to the grinding I don't know but um yeah but I feel I like the the bleached flour almost is maybe more I don't know if it's more or less absorbent because it, it almost feels like it gets a little tackier and gummier when you have sort of when it starts to hydrate in a way does that make sense I might be making this up yeah, no, I um, I do think most bleached flowers are um, a little bit finer than kind yeah. of an all-purpose. Yeah. And um, that definitely changes the way that it picks up water. Yeah, for sure. That was hard, Tucker. Sorry. Do you that want was me? very hard. How about, how about an easy one? Okay. 
Uh, okay, this is from Amy4130. What's the best way to cook rice? Rinse ahead of time or no? Add salt and or oil to the pot or no? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> So true. Um, I, it, I, it really does depend on what you're trying to do with the rice. Mm -hmm. um, if you are making risotto where you want the free starches to kind of bind up the liquid and kind of provide that creaminess that surrounds all of, um, all of those grains, you don't need to rinse, um, but that toasting step kind of helps, right? Like you, yeah. we always put oil in the pan and toast out the rice before we cook it. it um, but. Um, if I'm making um, rice, like a jasmine rice, um, I, my, my grandmother taught me that I have to rinse it until the water runs clear. Okay. Um, I do kind of wonder if she was just keeping us busy when we were kids, like, here, stir this <laughs> bowl of rice until the water is clear. You're in my hair! In my hair for five minutes. <laughs> right? Um, but uh, there is value in rinsing away that free starch mm. um, so you get a fluffier grain. Um, and you see that across a number of different uh, cuisines. Like um, there's a Persian rice dish called tadik, mm, and the rice is definitely yum. rinsed there so that it can be nice and fluffy. Yep. Um, it's cooked in, um, there's fat that surrounds the grains before you cook the rice. Yeah. Um, back to the rice my grandmother was making, um, no oil, no salt. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way rice is cooked if you're Chinese or Vietnamese and you're making plain rice to go with dinner. Um, yeah, so I would say it depends. It totally depends. I agree with you there because there's so many different styles of rice dishes and also mm -hmm. different kinds of rice. I mean, yeah. you know, arborio or, or something that you use in risotto is so different from kind of a, a Carolina long grain, you know, or a jas mm -hmm. jasmine or any of those things. So it totally depends. I have to say, though, I love a rice cooker. <laughs> Yeah, I the just best. feel like they're so great because like they take away every ounce of anxiety. You just like put the stuff in the thing and push a button and then later you eat it. It's so great. Yeah. They, um, can I say, I, so I grew up with a rice cooker mm. and um, to this day, whenever I'm at home, um, at my parents' home or my sister's home, there's rice around. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the rice cooker. It's always warm because that's one of the functions that rice cookers have. Yeah. And um, I'm, I am constantly snack on rice. Totally. It's like, I'll just wander by, grab like a spoon and like take out a little spoonful and like continue on with my day. I love that. But I love it. It's, it's just, it's part of, it was part of almost every single meal from when I was a kid mm -hmm. and um, and going back to that question about things I couldn't live without mm -hmm. rice I I if I had to I could give up bread and cheese but I could not give up rice that's that that is a Sophie's choice <laughs> bread <laughs> cheese rice which one goes first uh, which one goes first I don't know. Um, maybe, oh, could I say this? Maybe bread, because I've got rice for my carbs. Yes, yeah. okay. Is that, is that right? I don't know. I don't know what about either. you? I, I, I would rather chop off a limb. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, um, I guess I could not live without bread. I, I feel like, like a deep emotional um stirring when i think about bread and i think about yeah. the aroma of bread and i think about just the you know bread alone you know like it's it's so basic but also transformative i don't know there's something really remarkable about bread for me but then bread without butter is like a a day without sunshine i mean well, I said cheese, not butter. Oh, we can't right. Give up okay. Butter. Good. Yeah, no, we're not doing it. You're butter. safe. Okay. Um, cheese. Oh, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> I don't Do know. You know. I have to pass um, on that question. I, I can't. I can't. Right. I can't choose. You're lucky. None of the readers asked. <laughs> Do you know that the cheese? You know how the, at the grocery store there's like a cheese section, which is kind of like the really big brand kind of craft 
cheeses and then the cheese mm -hmm. island where they sometimes have like olives and you know little meats and things like that yeah cheese is like in the top three of purchases at any grocery store in the country i read this recently that like cheese they they have started merchandising cheese over the past 20 years in more and more places throughout the store because so much of it it, it, it's a it's a grocery list item, but also an impulse buy item, and so the more yeah. you have it around the store, the more like you are. Oh, just a few mozzarella balls. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are coming home with me. Let's go. Yep. All right, I have a question for you. All right. Let's pretend, Lon, that the bars have reopened. Okay. This world that we this are living in right now has transformed and we're able to go out for a drink and you and I are going out for a drink, which I can't wait. Mm -hmm. What do you order? What's your first cocktail out back in the world? Oh gosh. So we're indoors and we're at a bar. Yep. Um, a big, like cavernous bar and like plenty of seats, not like a cha-cha bar, more like a really like, let's sit down and have this drink and like get into it. Oh man. Um, okay, so it'd be gin based, I think. I love you. Yeah, because that's <laughs> I, I I can't I have uh, I can't become a cocktail nerd. I know too much about food. I'm super annoying when I go out, and so I've I I try to like know just enough to order what I want, yep. but not so much that I'm annoying. Like I will not ask you about what kind of gin you're gonna put in my gin drink. Um, I trust you, but. Oh, gosh. Kind of want to say a martini, but that might be a bit too much for the first drink. I feel like I want to take it a little bit slower. I've laid off cocktails while, uh, while I've been at home. Wow, good for you. Um, maybe a last word? Oh, tell me about that. What's that? Um, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. This is part of my, like, I can't know too much about <laughs> cocktails. But it's lemony and light and, mm. um, and oh, it's so good. Now I feel really bad that I can't tell you exactly how to is make it. Is it on it. rocks or is it, like, in a up glass? Or? It's, it's usually served in a martini ga mm. glass or a coupe. Um, Oh man, I really want to look this up right now since this laptop is right in front of me. It almost sounds like a gimlet. <laughs> in a way, sort of like still a very alcoholic drink, but with kind of a lighter flavor yeah. profile. Yeah. Mm. No, I um, I have like this whole list of cocktails, cocktail names that I know I enjoy. <laughs> I have no idea how to make any of them. I just, I can't, I can't walk down that road. People would stop serving me and that'd be no good. <laughs> and you're, you're what would that you order? customer. <laughs> I'll have a martini. I just, I, and mm -hmm. I cannot wait. <laughs> Wait, uh, garnishes? Lemon. Yeah, twist. Okay. Always a twist. I don't mind a martini mm -hmm. olive, but I don't want to have it in my drink for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I much prefer okay. kind of the lift of a twist. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll go crazy and make it a Gibson, put in a, put in a cocktail onion instead. Do you know, Just, I've never had a Gibson. Maybe that's what I should get Why not? when we finally go out for cocktails. Yeah. I, I love onions. I like pickled onions. You, I like martinis. It's your alley and What could go gym. wrong? <laughs> All the food groups. I can't wait for right? us to do that. That's going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be great. Uh, All gosh, right. now I'm like thinking about cocktails I want to order. This is bad. I have another question for you, which is, okay. what is, what is your favorite recipe that you've developed for ATK? and you can only pick oh. one. Uh, define favorite. Most proud of? That, the, th um, that the one that felt most like um, a personal achievement for you. Uh, cast iron pan pizza. Oh, so only good. because I'm, I, I mean, I work with baking pros, and mm. I'm totally intimidated by them. Um, uh, most, almost all of the Cook's Illustrated pizza recipes are developed by Andrew Janjagi, and pizza is his, it's maybe his third love. 
He's amazing. Was, <laughs> that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, 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 or maybe he wouldn't try to choose between bread and pizza and mushrooms. I don't know. Um, but uh, his, his stuff is so great. And I love it when AJ gets a pizza recipe mm. because I get to eat pizza. And even when it's not great, it's great. Um, and so when, when I started that recipe, I was just like, I, oh man, how am I going to do this? I don't know anything about pizza. And um, it was it was fun to research. I, I got to nerd out about bread and yeast and proofing and auto lees and like, I love food science. And so that was fun. Yeah. Um, I got to do a deep dive into Pizza Hut training videos and like, <laughs> They were like these people who were 80s-tastic, like blue eyeshadow, yeah. the little bow. Those are uh, my people. Great, it was fantastic. <laughs> but like super serious about training you on how to make a pizza, how to build it, how to top it. And, um, and then getting to actually kind of dive in there knowing just what I'd researched and just what I'd picked mm. up attending tastings. Um, was was super engaging and i'm really proud of the results like it's it's a popular recipe and i'm so glad that i got to you know help people figure out how to make a pan pizza it's um so cool you know it was so cool i feel like one of the coolest things um that we do at atk is is take something that on its surface it's very familiar, like, oh, yeah, a, sort of a, a little pizza. Everybody knows what that is, everybody has an opinion about it, but then to really dig into what are the like characteristics of each isolated piece of this thing and how can I almost like dissect it and then uh, and analyze it and then reassemble it in a way that um, doesn't necessarily change the character of it but like really just sort of um seals in the sense that all of these pieces all of these elements the the, the ingredients the the technique the the motion you use the heat all of these things really work together to create something that you know has harmony i love that it's so cool yeah it's um i think we're pretty lucky to to get to work here it's um it's a fun gig yeah um actually while we're talking about favorites mm. Can um, one of one of the the ways that Cook's Country has developed since you uh, since you joined the team? Gosh, mm. six seven years ago. Six, it's been a while. Six and change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the 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 art has totally developed. Like mm. the way you present recipes, the way things are photographed, the covers, like, can you, do you have a favorite um, layout or cover or, you know, recipe just art wise? Just You know, I love when food um, is so visually beautiful on its own that when it comes to photographing it, what you're really doing is just trying to bring out that kind of inner beauty or sort yeah. of graphic quality of it. So I think some of my favorites, first of all, this will reveal that I have like an in just non-satisfiable <laughs> sweet tooth, but um, <laughs> we did a cover a year or so ago on homemade ice cream that doesn't require an ice cream machine. And ice cream, mm -hmm. I'm already in, like as soon as it's a picture, it could be a terrible picture of ice cream and I'm already <laughs> excited about it. Um, but Morgan Bowling, who is one of our developers, uh, worked on this recipe and she created, I think, a dozen different flavors. And so there's swirls and there's um, sort of, it's sort of these beautiful colors of things with, with stirrings and not with stirrings. And we just photographed them all in loaf pans in this really graphic kind of way for the cover, which I love. And then my second favorite one, which was not a cover, but I kind of wish it had been, was uh, pineapple upside down cake. Because again, you get this round thing with these like round circles on it, you know, these like iconic it's shapes so of graphic. pineapple. I love yeah. that. It's just like, you see something like that and it's immediately like a mood left. Like this is great and I can mm -hmm. anticipate that this is gonna 
be sweet and like it just tastes so good and um I, I love that recipe too so. oh yeah yeah the, those ice creams i morgan could have kept on developing and oh i would God. have kept on sneaking by for tastes you know she came up with so she did flavors like strawberry and and um butterscotch and things like that and chocolate and stuff and but she a few of them ended up on the cutting room floor because morgan got really excited and into it um and honestly if you <laughs> were to ever reach out to morgan on social media or something and ask her about ice cream flavors she would let you know that you can kind of she made ice cream with like brussels sprouts at one point oh my gosh. which why not i mean sure yeah. go for it yeah. um because ice cream has that beautiful texture and, and you can imagine if it's not sweet and i think this happens in certain parts of the world in certain cities where it isn't necessarily a sweet experience but it's a cold experience and it's a smooth experience and you can imagine how different kinds of flavors other than the chocolate chips and the funfetti that you know you you kind of get up in New England um, can really translate into something interesting there. Yeah, oh, that sounds so good. Ice cream today would be very nice. <laughs> it really would. I've got a little Ben and Jerry's left in the fridge. Oh, Might no. have to break into that. What kind? Um, like you're standing I... at the Ben and Jerry's display. Yeah, what no, I have a go-to. Yeah. I get the same one every time. I adore Chubby Hubby. Aww. It's my favorite. It's salty. It's uh, The peanut butter ice cream is fantastic. I, I It's my favorite. Um, yeah. Oh, it's so good. And it's not always available everywhere, which yeah. is so disappointing. People buy more of this stuff so I can find it everywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll all do our part. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a call to action. Um, mm. Oh, I have a question. Can I ask you another question? I'm sorry, I'm so yeah, curious sure. about you. Um, what is your favorite, or maybe what is your most worn non-ATK cookbook? Like, what, what is the one that you, when you're like, I don't know how to do something, or, or I, I need a new idea, or what is the one that you pick up and use the most? What has the most stings on it? Oh man, I I don't know if I have a great answer to this cuz it I don't I don't use cookbooks at home like mm. for like to look for recipes. I feel like I'm constantly bombarded with yeah. uh with recipes and so um Yeah, I don't I don't really have a go-to. I have um I have go-tos for when I'm researching, but mm -hmm. you know that it's very, it's very dependent on what what type of cuisine I am. Um, I'm trying to bone up on. Um, yeah. Oh, that's weird. I I really don't. Um, do you have a Do you have a go-to cookbook? I guess, um, like you, it kind of a little bit depends on what I'm wanting to do. I don't really use cookbooks in the sense of like, I'm going to open up this book and, and, and cook this thing. I often do if I get a new cookbook, I will cook a couple of things mm -hmm. sort of straight out of it. Um, I probably grab the joy a lot because yeah, um, it, it, I feel like the recipes work and they're very clear and it's easy to doctor them up if you want to take it in a new direction. Um, I, I loved the, the, the cookbook that I loved the most when I first started getting interested was French Cooking in 10 Minutes by mm -hmm. Edouard de Pomain because all of his recipes, this was written like in the 30s, but they're all like short little paragraphs. They're not actually like yeah. lists and then instructions. And it's written in such a conversational way of just like open the window because you're going to make a steak in a pan and it's going to get smoky. So you're going to want to open the window. And I just really appreciate yeah. that kind of like real life advice. And it made everything feel I was able to visualize the action of cooking. Like it's, uh, a lot yeah. of cookbooks will help me visualize what the dish is gonna look like or maybe what mm -hmm. the steps entail, but the actual action of the way that you move around the kitchen and use your hands on the board, that one really stands out for me as, um, as one that like, that got me fired up about cooking in the first place. Yeah. For sure. I, gosh, I'm thinking through, like I am, um, I've realized that I 
When I'm looking at kind of Western cuisine, I've got a set of the old time life books. <gasps> Those are so um, great, aren't they? Right, I, um, I've got, oh gosh, like maybe 12, 15 of them yeah. back there. And um, they're so good for like, figuring out how people used to do a thing and trying to figure out and, and figuring out how um, techniques have changed. Yeah. Um, they often kind of inspire um, or prompt me to test things that we don't really do these days because we have convenience tools that like allow us to skip steps, but um, it kind of lays out why you should do a thing mm -hmm. and how people used to do things. Um, and that was, that's really interesting to me. The, the, to see how cooking techniques have developed. Um, um, I love that and series. And I'm realizing... It's so, it's so it's iconic so good. the way that it looks, too. Those photographs and yeah. the spines. I can just picture them. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I, I'm realizing that, like, besides the ones that I'm using for research, the books that I go through the most right now are... I have this one book about wine that mm. um, I've been kind of flipping through my... Um, I worked at a, a bunch of French places, and so my wine training is pretty French-focused. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to get more familiar with Italian wines and um, New World wines. Mm -hmm. um, and so this book has been kind of fun to just flip through. It's very, um, it's very infographic-y. It's called Wine Folly. It's fantastic for anyone who's looking to learn more about wine That's cool. in kind of a piecemeal flip to a page and learn a thing kind of way. Um, it's it's a really great resource, and so I've I've been going through that book. That's such a, a good recommendation, because I feel like if like the idea of learning about wine is so overwhelming, <laughs> like there's so much to it. It is, you know, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, such yeah. a big world, and you'll never know everything. And to to have a resource where you could just like flip to a page and like just take that in, and that's really great. Yeah, it's it's beautifully done too. It's um. It's it's made to be it'd make a great coffee table book. Um, yeah. Plus, you can yeah. enjoy a glass of wine while you're perusing it to really bring the experience home. I don't know. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. While we're on uh, wine. Yeah. Um, from Cots BL, what's the best beverage to cool down on a hot Friday? I don't know. I really enjoy a gin and tonic. Um, I, yeah. Though I would never say no to a really incredibly cold beer, and I'm not that picky about beer either. So, yeah. Um, especially if there was a little bit of uh, physical activity ahead of, like, after a hike. Oh, mm -hmm. baby, a beer. Yeah. 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 How about you? Yeah, I think anything that's good ice cold, mm. like I, you know, like I love wine, but. A lot of wines aren't great ice cold, so that's yeah. at the window. Yeah. Um, well, the frosé. Yeah, that's true. Oh my gosh, have you had beer slushies? No. Oh, Tucker. Oh God. Beer slushies. Um, you can make them at home. Okay. We might explode a bottle or two trying this, so mm. uh, you're what forewarned. A way to go. <laughs> right. Um, but. Uh, find your favorite beer that comes in a bottle, stash it in your freezer for about an hour, maybe 75 minutes. And um, I'm not going to get the science right, but the because of the alcohol um, content, the the it won't freeze immediately. It'll it actually takes a while to freeze, but the the liquid itself gets to temperatures where ice crystals can form. Oh, wow. And so when you pop that top. Um, and the um, bubbles start to kind of come up and f the beer starts to foam. Yeah. That foaming action starts the crystallization process and so you can pour a slushy out of your beer bottle. Love that idea. All right, um, okay, I'm gonna have to do that. Beer slushies. <laughs> I love that idea. All right, Lon. See? You did a, this is a question from MRW Sensitive Foodie. Okay. Lon, you did a video on chocolate. Can you make chocolate from cocoa butter and cocoa powder? Nope. <laughs> um, Be fun to try. It would, yeah, I mean, I guess you could try, but um, 
I don't think you just like you can't take a, a, a egg yolk and egg and an, and an egg white and mash them together to make an egg. <laughs> you can't really get chocolate by taking the two components that have been separated from each weird. other. Um, uh, yeah, like I mean, I think you could get something that was chocolatey tasting mm. um, that you could bake with. But if we're talking like a nice bar of chocolate to eat, I'm sorry. Are you, I, I mean, I know that you know so much about chocolate and you've made some amazing chocolate recipes, but are you like a cho chocolate fanatic? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know how there are chocolate people and there are lemon people? Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to desserts, like it, um, yeah. if you look at a dessert menu, any dessert menu, there's always gonna be a chocolate thing. There's yep. always gonna be a citrus fruit thing. Um, and there will be something that's kind of nut, almond, mm -hmm. savory, sweet, but not chocolate heavy or fruit heavy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a chocolate person, okay. for sure. Yeah, it's pretty satisfying after dinner, especially. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's dark. I don't know. I, dark, um, light, milk, white. Just good. Just good. Um, I'll leave it yeah, up. like there's. The, for any of you who are out in the Bay Area, um, there's this little chocolate maker in Santa Cruz um, that I went to last summer. I think they're called Mutari. And um, they had these amazing single origin chocolates. Um, and I know this sounds fancy and like a little shishi, but it's just shocking how many flavors are in um, chocolate that kind of get um, processed away mm. in the mass produced stuff. And these smaller makers, um, they, they, can, they can process their chocolates so that you can get the very distinct, subtle aromas that you wouldn't find in, um, you know, like a Scharfenberger mm. or a Godiva. And like, I love those chocolates too, they're great, um, but in the same way that like i don't know there's terroir when you're talking about wine there's terroir so when you're talking true. about chocolate terroir and also the the fingerprint of the producer you know yeah yeah chocolate is remarkable it's, that way because it it can be it can have tobacco it can add like all of those like tasting notes that you associate with wine not all of them maybe yeah. but so many of them it involves being present and really paying attention, really thinking about it and articulating it while you're eating, but you can really unlock yeah. so much complexity by paying attention. Yeah. I, um, I remember when I was working in pastries and this was like 15 years ago, um, they, we used this one brand of, um, or this one style of chocolate that I really didn't understand because it didn't taste like chocolate to me. It was kind of sour and, um, I don't know, it was just, it wasn't what I grew up eating. It was like, what is, why is this sour? I expect chocolate to be chocolatey. Yeah, it like be a sweet Snickers. And bitter <laughs> and milky and chocolatey. Um, but um, as I have continued to try more and more, I'm appreciating the, that like, you, you can find like banana flavors and mm. almond flavors and passion fruit flavors in chocolate. And when you have the, um, when you have these special types of chocolate, you can pair them with things like lemon and you wouldn't think lemon and chocolate would be good, but if you have the right chocolate, it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, head on over to americastestkitchen.com for more recipes and cooking advice and all kinds of stuff. Lon, it's so good to see you. I can't wait to see you in person. I hope it's very soon.